I'm not sure where I left off last time, so I'm going to backtrack, I think, and go back to Golden Compass movie and other movies that were made about, um, that relate to that, related to trafficking. So some of the kids were the files of the Golden Compass. They thought they were, at first, in Arctic regions of the North Pole even sometimes, and this was part of uh, pulling out altars and mind control manipulation. One of the places they brought them to was actually a fur store. And um, a man would be met there that had like this cone head. We called him Conehead McDaniel. And he named a lake after himself. And there's this big polar bear on top of the store that was throwing out snowballs. And then it'd be like 90 degrees outside and you'd have to go get a fur coat and go to this place. So it didn't really make much sense. And then there was another place that was like a little uh, tucked away house on a, like a lake front area that also had two polar bear statues that you would also go to and it was called the furrier house with more polar bears throwing snowballs at each other on the statues so they made the character in the maniac series about him selling creepy scammer fur coats that weren't really made of white wolf material because there was a white wolf seven pack that was um, integrated with some of the super soldier children and they would actually even make um, videos and run through the woods at night and uh, for long stretches of time had a uh, white wolf encoded to them. And some of them even wore white furs. And I think Kanye West even tried to copy the white wolf in one of his videos too. So there's another, there's cities correlated to this and these files, Golden City, and then another city named Golden. And the Golden Compass has dual meanings too. And the spiritual meaning of the Golden Compass was the inner Golden Compass that some of the kids had that would always just lead them through situations and they had an internal uh, enlightenment and light that could lead them and they could walk through woods, say like for hours at night and have a very good sense of direction. So one cafe in a golden city was called Cookies and they drug the cookies there and the pies. And then they put it in your face by making a big statue of a pie lady holding a pie out to you in a museum that they had some of the children go and collect ancient artifacts and relics for them to uh, basically stock this museum up like um, a living library and museum that was uh, had to do with their lives and their team and the lives in the program. So there's many coves, many docks, many uh, harbors, many marinas. Coney Island Dock was the name of one of them. Uh, different harbor resorts and lodges, uh, cabins, coves, secret coves. There was even a Bond family in one of them. I incurred a fatal head wound at one of these areas and had a uh, near-death life experience. We also had training in these remote mock-up village areas um, that were tucked way back on dirt roads. And to them, it was like necromatic playgrounds. Shell Knob was a big area. And the traffickers lived on Airport Road down in Table Rock. And then they slowly lost their power bases there. And that was really hard to watch uh, because there's a lot of million dollar mansions peppered all throughout that area. And at one point it was just um, the traffickers basically that had set their base there on uh, Blackberry Lane or something like that. And um, we would go from one vacation club to another, bouncing around, going from condos to resorts to yachts, get dropped off by boats, um, backways, boat rides at night. Um, so it was a very confusing shuffleboard, especially with all the various clubs and memberships and golf places, helicopters, private planes, etc. And they do a lot of this out in the public. And people just think that people are just on vacation or um, they don't question the narrative that's going on a lot of times, things that are being done openly in the public. In plain sight, um, there was lions even in one area. And uh, spiritually... It was like feeding, your life felt like you were feeding lions in this backwoods yard, these monsters, to, to appease them 
and then yet keep a safe distance with certain individuals just to survive despite the forced uh, interactions. So in Golden, they had us collect relics for them to stock up a museum. And then what they did is they locked our lunch boxes and thermoses and cages. Um, the relationships were very confusing at first with trainers and handlers and, and whatnot in different groups that had us because they would um, buy you lunch boxes and um, thermoses that went with them, or you know what they could buy you, what you couldn't get, um, what you could get from them, what the boundaries were that were established and the, the mind games what they wanted from you. And it seemed like every move that you made, they would use that to, they were uh, obsessed with it, uh, with documenting um, things. They even made a movie out of one of the, the lunch boxes. So uh, one of the kids in the program, Sean had a thermos that said, destroy all evil. And uh, this place we were at was originally uh, a, decrepit like creepy toy museum that we were stuck at it seemed we were like stuck there for a while behind a time wall and there were hybrids and glass and wood cribs trafficked babies and then they later put train displays in them and then kept the place very vintage looking and said that it was for children after a while uh, or the wife said that they even put an old buggy seat in front that we had used on a mission once too and um, all the things that were collected are behind glass um, cages and the lunch boxes are a wall and certain things that they took from um, children's in the program's childhood and they have put them behind they put them behind caged fences now so that was really nice of them so Carthage, Carthage Missouri also had like a mock-up um, Red Oak Village there's Red Oak Village 1 and 2, uh, and certain archery places and stuff they would name like 1, 2, or 3. And it's a mock-up village from around 1903. And from Dog Patch to Dogwood, we had to walk this line in the nature park before it was even a nature park to not bring over any memories. Um, this is a mental construct they did with us, to not bring over any memories over that line of Arkansas experiences and what we knew there to Missouri I mean, because this is back in the day when, um, you know, the Clintons took over Arkansas and all of that crazy stuff was happening down there and it separated in our minds what was happening between Arkansas line and Missouri to keep a wall in our minds. They built that wall up there about the instances of the two bordered places. They'd always make sure like that that line was always there, not just in that spot, but in other spots and that that wall in our minds, they would try to have um control over um, but it didn't work for too long of course and we brought that wall down um, by our own accord and um, the mental imagery and mental tricks didn't work anymore about the two bordered states and then they had a buffalo rock marking a spot um, for the non-carryover programming and turtle rocks from Oklahoma were also laid where we could swim and other markers so it was like a dump memory park a memory park dump, imaginary line place, these places that they set up um, with their tech manipulation that eventually uh, unraveled and didn't work on us because of mainly um, their failed promises would be agreed to have our minds messed with or even tweaked and uh, knowing inherently that that distrust was there and that we had to trust ourselves. So markers were recorded and it was like a synthetic artificial overlay and we were thrown uh, into a pit area with stones and then the steel door was shut and there's other areas that had water for the waterfalls and stuff. But what we would see in this pit area was a fire Yeti come out of the hole. These are manufactured hybridized beings from real Bigfoots. And this thing would rage at us and he'd throw fire in the middle of the pit. So then they end up naming that place fire pit cave. And he had red eyes. Um, the very hollow entities when they mess with a, a natural animal's DNA or creature and they named one cave, the kid cave also because we were small enough to go in and we would do things for them. 
Sam Springs was named in correlation to the Sam character in Supernatural. And we had mind simulations together uh, also at times like a way to program or reprogram ourselves in sessions and get rid of or dispose of PTSD, extra baggage, dangerous altars like Beast from X-Men or like a witch altar, or any dark part of us that we no longer wish to carry. So we had sessions like that with each other and places that we call the mind palace. So our altars were highly theatrical and I can see why they use them for movie character files like Rowena and Bipolar Ben on the Ozarks, etc. But uh, we knew to, to um, bypass certain circus that they had trained us in and just organically do these things on our own. So we became like self healers at an early age and learning from um, our higher selves. And we knew many of the Sotheby's mansions, uh, a lot of these castle mansions, pioneer houses, Lancelot Lane, Reflection Ridge, a lot of different ridges that were outlined, Safety Harbor Lane, the Golden Age Museum of Time Relics, um, and certain people that helped us along the way too in our time schisms and what seemed like trap areas, trap zones. So we also dealt with a witch on a peninsula near a train that was controlled by operatives in Charleston, South Carolina, and experienced a lot there. And that's where the name Pineapple Express came from, from the pineapple that's there in that point of origin. And then we sealed Cthulhu that was in a man in the pirate house too, which is the oldest house in Charleston, South Carolina. So the secret space program used radionics and other means of detecting anomalies and supernatural vibrations and frequencies that would send out like a ping for us to investigate or gather information such as glowing white triangles on fences, orbs, floating rocks, or other variables. And um, supernatural anomalies that would be picked up and scanned for that they wanted to figure out and correlate why and hows and what to do about it and if it was a, a threat to national security or even galactic security and before like I said there's also um, higher hypertech that can scan uh, neutrino detectors that can scan for entities so Shell Ridge was also a training camp in Devil's Pool Road. Uh, we called John the Silver Surfer because he had like a back door to time travel made already and would do very interesting things that nobody had ever done before. So he'd have to have his own like specifically type of debriefing and programming and deprogramming. That was very time consuming. And um, I think they learned a lot from this though. Uh, he had like a backdoor to time travel made and would jump from place to place as one energy, whole energy body, like a silver time travel pools that were linked to various, even physical hotel pools or aesthetic markers. He had these doors that he had created and like we amalgamated with the tech, just like we did at Montauk as the frequency carriers of the tower. And they wanted us to be um, organic mini micro machines and uh, living weapons that we're always transmitting and receiving. So Eagle Rock Loop was also a place in places with the word shell and other places to remind us of shell shock too. And of um, turning those old shells over, getting each other stuck out of moments. And we could even leave objects for each other at a future reference point. And the USAPs that are documented back and flowing are back and forth flowing windows of time. And their apertures had spaces to bring out uh, old tech per se into certain time slots or perform, bring it to an area and perform surgeries in a place like uh, Rochester, Minnesota, Mayo Wood, that was used as this type of like time containment place and the underground had time containment. So Nazis were at these mansions in Rochester and then they traded super soldier surgeries for research opportunities in an uneasy alignment and that involved, um, and you know, the mansions even had, and still do have swastikas on their floors. So it's not very hard to find these places and the tower rooms. And so that involved the project talent children and combined projects in various facilities, which became Hydra arms to research companies in the future. And quantum circumlocution makes the present circumspect and possible through organic translation that needs no carrier waves really or synthetic apparatuses because you can decouple from the synthetic and artificial when you absorb just the organic. 
It's like shedding skin when you've seen organic translation, like Enoch, and the old self destroyed cellularly, emerging into the new self's DNA in a fire branding of purity. You know, they have the Methuselah project, but their real aim was to know how Enoch got translated. Translation happens through surrender to the highest will, though, and that facilitation and the most high gods um, allowing it to happen and absolving you into the highest form of yourself. So we also saw towers collapse um, that are like TV towers um, with weather warfare portal tech in Fordland Festus city. And we watched uh, old timey movies at Aurora Sunset Drive-In Theater and counted the days, watched many sunsets, many places, sunrises, got chased by a cat creature with yellow eyes down the sinking creek at Echo Bluff Park, ran many miles at Pershing Park. Uh, got chased with arrows at Eisenhower Park, scuba dived Lake Truman, um, and were like assets sent into an area to gather information. And they had they can have a water lab in in a lake very easily. So we had to prove uh, powers of mind persuasion in instances too, as we were growing uh, and accelerating out of the bases. And we saw them do this type of thing with one guy that uh, made tornado turtle shells for kids mainly, and it's failed marketing attempts due to an agent's display of mental manipulation on him to do this and make this thing. Uh, it was just an experiment to see the powers of mental persuasion manipulation on any, any random person and its effectiveness and its outcomes. But the poor guy uh, fell for it and didn't have a successful business, of course. So then we were also taken to places like Demonico Mansion in the 70s and people would stop by off the bridge like a roadside circus show arrow that was pointing to the balcony areas. So these people were just observing and eating hot dogs, watching the show because people were way more trusting of stopping at um, about they were more trusting back then about stopping at like random um, road displays of signs than say they would be today. So uh, they're just kind of more naive, I guess, in the 70s and, and open about that. So uh, they thought they were going to see a show, these people. They had no idea that kids were being brought to these places and some were genetically engineered, had use of made genes to float over crocodiles, put on certain shows like they had some sort of mental prowess over the alligators and the crocodiles or something. But they didn't realize that it wasn't a show um, that was just tricks. Something went wrong during one of these shows and, uh, John's body was disabled and he was on this big rock and these alligators they had in the backyard and this fenced area down by the water. And there was crocodiles on the grass that were coming to him. And these had been trained to eat human flesh that were coming near him. So then me and Cass had to rescue his body and, uh, get it going, um, so he could move his muscles and get him up and going. So then there was, there was a coven of Dracos there that would actually throw young girls over the balcony. Um, if they didn't do what they wanted them to, to the crocodiles and, um, orange lights were always aglow over the backyard of this place and, um, cast over lake areas. And it just kind of cast this eerie glow everywhere. And it was always foggy too. So we called it the Twin Islands area in the D Mansion, Vampire Hunter D Mansion. And it also looked like a dog at first from the outside. Then it got destroyed by a storm once. And then the people that saw the show that went wrong and go and us go out of a script or character, they all had to be uh, mind wiped there. That went because it, the show went off script. So these, this mansion ended up getting rebuilt and added on to. Um, many people would just fly into this area to go to that place. And they would also have set up a portal gate tech that could be hidden in unseemly objects, such as like a lighthouse marking um, pole or a campground, some specific spot um, that would have something secret going on, like a water lab under the lake or something. It could be just in a random lamp post that just looked really old or anywhere really. 
And nobody really notices those things if they don't have a trained eye uh, to detect and pick up on hypertech. And, um, you know, it's kind of like seeing a, a very finite laser that you don't want to cross over um, to Kansas City and um, KC. And KC were two cities we frequented. The lower uh, Kimberling port had a hotel with a ship wheel on it. And we ran into the game room all the time uh, where we had privacy and there was no eyes on us. It was a black spot. And we would go and get briefed actually by the white hats to be able to go back and to encounter black hats when they didn't know that we were being used um, by the good team. And they thought they had us in their projects only. So we dealt with a lot of warlocks in that area. Kids were being trafficked through that hub and the Lions Club members, which were warlocks that cross-dressed in a lot of parties there and were very awful people. And there was a blue horse that marked the area and a wagon behind it uh, marking time travel trips like the blue Pegasus horse that's also in various other places in the world. And we fought um, mermaids at a stormy point that was modeled after a Rhode Island fishing village. And we were also taken to the Queen of Africa house where there was inlaid 3D crocodiles onto the floor that were like nine feet long and heavy programming before we were actually taken to the continent of Africa. And these people also had crocodiles in the water and it was a gated private residence and extremely cursed. And they were taken, um, the, there was entities of crocodiles that they would summon up out of their floorboards that the eyes would turn orange and get animated. Um, they had various African gods and goddesses they worshiped at this place, of course. So it was, the physical and interdimensional um, fighting that went along with it. And then they'd throw in like a, a guy that was all in safari that would try to get you all amped up in this place. Um, or like another like jungle guy, like some African guy that would like chase you outside. So they had different things that they did at that place. So another time I was brought up out of the vase to go to a uh, wood carver that had been making statues and had a black snake that he placed on me on top of a pedestal. Uh, and they would do things like this and try to make you sit still um, to invoke like Apophis or these ancient uh, serpent entities from Egypt and stuff. And this thing was suffocating and they would take a portrait or a drawing of these things. So then we later would detect the signatures of these entities that we had encountered. We could hear them and we knew how to uh, defeat them. Some of these entities like Apophistar and serial killers and um, body hop. So that was another purpose of using the secret space program um, for various body maneuvers, because if these entities are body hopping all the time, then you would need somebody that would go in stream and in sync line with them to be five steps ahead of them to stop them from continuing to do this and piggybacking uh, on consciousnesses. So the kids were um, very strong down in these, these ports and river areas. Uh, we actually had to swim across the river at Shell Knob once before there was even a bridge there and then stopped at a tree in the middle to take a break to get across. And then we remember this area because when we looked back at it, um, the bushes there and that tree just from a distance at night looked like the shape of a rabbit. So we knew a lot of these remote areas. Um, it was just nests uh, of evil that were overtaken, overtaken people in nests and dangerous creatures in a lot of places. And oh, such as the Alpha Draco Demonica Mansion, El Dorado Springs had an uh, Umbrella Academy Fight Club going on there. They had a huge Masonic building overlooking the park where we would fight, say, like three or four reptilians at a time and then team up or whatever they would send through the Babylon 1913 building time tech gates doors. You know, this is where they get the information for the Friends show and the typewriters and things like that. They would try to do these things um, in a revolving interdimensional door to send things through, uh, to summon things up, to hide things in areas, in, in buildings and bricks. And 
to try to rewrite people's minds and, and whitewash them because the people that they used in this area just seem very hollow. Everyone was always in white in this area, whitewashed minds, very blank, hollow eyes. They were always staring at you. They would try to recreate reality there. They had the stonewashed basin as a scrying bowl there. And then they would jump the pioneers that would come into the area and try to um, rob them uh, or sacrifice them. And there's also uh, something called the reptilian stone, the reptilian eggs that they put in the stonewashed basin with their scrying bowl. So down in this park area, everyone would gather with their umbrellas all in white, like a cult, and they called all the children that they had their fairies, and they had to dress them up all in fluffy white too. They, they had this orange special reptilian that got sucked down the drain underground in the springs area after his hands were cut off. Um, then there was like Civil War ghosts that was lingering in the museum's doctor's office, and a lot of strange things happened in um, El Dorado Springs, which is also connected to El Dorado, Colorado. They used many, many cities that had the same names to use the portal tech on certain steps and certain areas to make it very hard and confusing for all of the time wars and the pedivore wars, which was the most honorable um, sector of uh, the USAPs. And the time bureau management, whatever you want to call it, time agents. So we also went on scout missions once in remote areas where body jumpers were, and then we acted like data collectors. And we were told not to go in certain places. They can't make you do anything, this and this, just do this. So we picked up the energy signatures, went to the area. We could pick up on gamma ray plasma burst potentials because things in us had already been measured in that, that we were going out to measure to dispel the parasitic frequency emanations that were... Uh, eluding or trying to elude the radar of an area so the old family that was there they tried to bring us to a field with stones and then use us for a ritual and we resisted nothing they did worked on us um, these people were like uh, ancient vampiric entities that were marrying children out there um, and it was just two women that married uh to one of them almost looked like a teenager, but it was like five of them in this very weird looking, what you would just perceive as a inbred hillbilly family, but it was more than that. Because what they do, and the entity comes into a child's body, um, it's the smallest child that was actually the most disturbing that we saw there. So the old family that was there um, they got fed up with us. They couldn't do anything with us. Um, the worst of that family was this little albino kid who was an ancient entity that would just say really filthy and disgusting things to you and taunt you. Um, so what they did is they ended up throwing us in a canoe in this area and just sending us off thinking that we were you know, just going to die in a canoe down the river. So we ended up walking through the woods at night and got back to, uh, we knew where somehow with our golden compass internally where the town was, which is about 10 miles away and we survived. So we were also at places like JT coffee camp, number 37 near confluence points and bodies of water. And, uh, I had a snake bite once in my hand while burying a small treasure chest and then had to return to the base ship afterwards because I had snake venom in my body. So we took pictures also of early firefighters, early 1900s. Um, that was put on a military gate in Oklahoma. And then one event was also at a resort where they brought in a bunch of program kids from around the world. And they made it seem like they were filming a, a legitimate movie, but it wasn't. And people were recording them like a news crew came in, like a, a filmmaking was this cover for this gathering of program kids. And I had on an American flag swimsuit. I'd be like saluting the flag to impress my trainers everywhere. And um, I'd have lunch at a place with a table that overlooked the Ozarks with 1776 and defend signs uh, because we knew what the future timeline was already locked in and was coming. So they were preparing us in a good aspect in this part of the program to 
to stay loyal to the United States of America and defend it. So I was, you know, saluting the flag to everywhere I went to impress my trainers. Um, we ended up getting mismanaged and um, became POWs in the time wars at times, but we forgive, but we don't forget. We had terrible times back in the Shell Knob places, um, cycling back there several times. There's a place called the Roadhouse Tavern that had many brawls in the dirt parking lot and a gangster car that was stuck in the side of the building that's still there as a marker of certain events that had transpired there. Um, this place had many secret training centers, teepee camps, um, funneling kids through and off planes all over Table Rock. And I had many identities in this area and lost track sometimes and uh, kind of strayed from the, the pack and got lost at times. So the Alpha Dracos were there from the 70s time period. Some unfriendly territory. Uh, they gave us code names like Lady Sybil, Anna, Jill Kinsey. Um, we had part of some bond missions there. We were also programmed, um, like I said, at the Africa house with the crocodile stuff that became crawling entities. So we ended up going back to out of the bases for good. And we went back and stalked the African house in the backyard and then retraced all of our steps and documented everything. And then our pictures and our retracing was intercepted and ruined at first. So then we had to go back and loop back and do it all over again. So it got pretty uh, exhausting and annoying uh, just trying to get your own story straight amidst the chaos that just certain bad individuals and intelligence will do to try to wreck everything. So we had the ability to leave things in future timelines for each other and from each other to find as future reminders of past events and identities and breakthroughs and clarity points and cognizance. So then we knew that would help in the um, on repression. So everything happening in 2020, some people have already seen, so it's not even deja vu for them, but review. So I had some high contracts in a remote place for a while and also had bouts of amnesia, brain damage even, and ill-intended people would want to contract um, super soldiers out to do like psi moves, uh, like dump this bucket of water out um, at the snap of their fingers or demand things that they didn't understand or know how enhanced people work or how these things worked. And it was damaging. And then clone bodies or doubles of us were brought to certain areas. And then those needed vials and serums to stay functional and drugs like a golem that they would uh, ingest the bodies um, saturate them or even bathe them with uh, fluids and play records backwards even like a cheap trick to animate your double sometimes they did this with jewelry even and um, some of it was a form of sorcery so there were many peaks and um, ports and coves and oh with frequency fences hypertech punched out portal points like coney island cove um, Time Travel Cafe was one of them. Um, Danny Trejo actually frequented that area and other clones. Arrow Point, Emerald Point, Mill Cove, Vampire Mill, Lighthouse Lodge, where I was also almost choked to death by a man in a room uh, who said that he had paid for me. But that was all changed and justice was served when I was blood bought by Yahushua, who then thwarted several attempts on my life once aspects of my life started changing in him and um, how this happened was that in one backwards backwoods resort it was completed and on the last day of its completion it's why nobody was there and um, they weren't happy with me the people that were handling me at the time i was brought here to this empty brand new empty resort and they had planned on killing me that morning and disposing of my body in table rock lake just like they tried to dispose of it in uh the murder rocks at the old murder rock um golf era so what happened is i was sitting outside and there was 
there was lawn chairs there and the Archangel Raphael showed up. My prayers were answered. He sat next to me in the lawn chair and he looked kind of ethnic. And he's been in a lot of my dreams too, a lot of visions and uh, has protected me when he's also showed me hell. So he told me exactly what they were going to do, showed me in my mind. And the man who had planned on taking me out on a boat that morning, in that misty, eerie, echoey morning, he had like his own murderous heart's energy go back in onto himself after the angel walked past him and left. And he had, he dropped dead right in front of me. So you have to be in agreement and be clean in the Lord and confess all your sins to continue to be in his graces for him to have such an allowance and favor on your life and to be under the wings of his protection like that because his promises are true. And if you're a friend of him and you stand for him, then nobody can stand against. So I had plans to finish serving Yahweh and he extended my life several times because of that. And then I ended up swimming across the cove as the angel showed me and was led to safety on a driveway. So we had also been brought to a house that was like a castle shack and in this back woods in a valley area, totally remote, um, behind a private resort, private property. There was this bear that they had in a pit that had green branches that they threw on top of it. And then we saw a bear. We saw the bear in there and he'd always be growling and he was always really ornery and then they bring him out they throw kids in that bear put and then they would bring the bear out and then they have a lion in a bear fight in their backyard with some like lights outside at night and these sorcerers had lions trained to attack certain movements and what they did was they injected see this is another battle with the white hats and black hats and we were always moved from line to line so we had to keep a lot of things secret um, in the secret space program, we'd be dropped off at places like this and they would think that they had captured us or had control of us somehow and had not known that we were already had been um, had these directives knowing what they were going to do. So we were injected with shots that were like fear inducing hormone shots. So our little bodies could not stop shaking. And then we were timed because somebody always had a timer, a clicker something to see how long we could stay still and how long it took to master any part of our bodies or any part or aspect of ourselves. It was all had to be perfection. So at first it was terrifying and we tried to get in the cupboards in this house, but they were like all blocked off from us. And then we tried to jump on the kitchen cupboards and then we ended up crumpling in balls on the floor and then getting scratched and mauled by these lions who would hover over your body and just growl at you. Um, I don't know if these lions were genetically manipulated or what, but it seemed like they were trained just to respond to your fear or a certain movement that you made. And they had hand signals that the sorcerers would use on them as the lion tamers there. So what we did, we'd crumple up in balls on the ground. We, we would go into the secret place where we found the Lord's voice. And that was the only stillness in this situation that got us out and through. And the voice said to me in that moment, as my hands could not stop shaking on my body, that we were lions in him. And then we became lions of Judah, the Nazarene lions in the image of Christ. And then we stopped shaking. We had the peace, the calm, the clarity and the focus. And he might've even flushed out those chemicals from our body because we weren't attacked after that and we could walk past the lions and they wouldn't attack us. We had a barrier, a supernatural barrier between us and the lions then. So we stood up and they were rebuked and the Lord loved us enough to shut the mouths of lions, just like he did in Daniel's lion's den. And he's also been the fourth man in the fire. He'll make you a faith water walker. And he's the hand that draws you out of deep water. And I'm living proof of his power and his love and his mercy and his strength and his justice. So that's why he preserved us and kept us alive. It was a highly spiritual operation. Even in my labs, he can work through or people that were created in a lab. So later on in this area, I incurred a fatal head wound. And then I was saved in the water by a Navy SEAL too. And it took me a long time to recuperate from that because I had brain damage and I was healed um, by Archangel Gabriel. 
So the secret space program spaceship, we came back onto um, in this castle shack, we called it, had different lights than the people's helicopter lights that they had in that area. Um, and they would dress up really old fashioned and um, just try to confuse you like with whatever time period this was. And then we actually got uh, some retribution and got to come back to this area and shoot the lions in the bloody grass after we did these Mission Impossibles there that was just unbearable. And um, they made a movie, Electra, about it and her impossible mission even from this time. So then we had the dead bloody lions laying in the grass in that area. And the castle shack was destroyed. It just kind of fell down, kicked in the last wall. Um, before this, we'd be taken to the White Swan in the Black, the Black Swan, Swan Creek area, Swan Township, the Double Bridges, the Red Lion Predator programming days, they called it. So then they had changed names, and then they would take us to the Red Lion Hotel on a red bus. And we became familiar with the Ghost in the Darkness, um, which was super soldier stuff. And the Death in the Long Grass book uh, by Peter Capstick, Red for Blood. And the word alighted also meant floating. And we rode on a red bus sometimes. So the dollhouse is, there was one particular dollhouse that was a body transfer house in Branson. And it was a gift house. They told us it was a gift to do these things and have these secret underground places. Um, that's where they got the files for the series Dollhouse uh, about the LA cloning facility. And people have a hard time understanding what and how super soldiers operate and really do. But in my experience, it was primarily the ability to, what they wanted most was to wage psychological warfare in any capacity, strength or form with any type of creation um, at a fast rate and divert all timeline probabilities um, the looking glass eye recon extraction quantum interfacing systems and amassing the ability to be in multiple contingency bodies for construent consecutive time allotment operations precise um, and etched out to exact increments assignments missions and adhere to program protocols effectively while following while following orders through time streams and maintaining central core body functions preservation initiatives and being equipped with certain genetic upgrades and apparatuses too, and being able to survive surgeries. So our spines were also manipulated and made of genes activated in exo endoskeletons defense, defensively masked and uh, mined from the moon and slowly brought up out of bases each season for different reasons. And we did these based on uh, linear time in a multi, we, um, we didn't do as much as a normal surgery would do based on linear time. In a multiple, we did more of a circular time-based quantum executions in multiplicative fashions as the limits were always extended for research and facilitation to funnel other further purposes, assets, and agents. They just used you like an accordion and then just hid and dumped a bunch of stuff in between the accordion and hopefully maybe you would be okay and come out normal at the end, they thought when you uh, unraveled so uh some of it was not um done with as much care as what it should have been we also had limousines parked behind a silo farm on a country road and this area was called Selmore, and we helped stop an operation to sell more kids and there was two ozark serial killers in this cattle facility that were actually skinning kids there's a lot of skinner families and that's why it's in the um, X files and making uh, adrenochrome. So we called them the butchers. They had a sign on a country road that said rabbit meat for sale. And if you said the right words, when you called the number, you'd be in contact with the loose people, of course, and their cult. So then when this atrocious operation was stopped, uh, the FBI got what they needed and they didn't have access to our fuller files. So because the USAPs, the president doesn't even um, access so they just thought uh, we were some kind of special teenagers and assumed we couldn't handle the reality of the events um, like other kids and people they dealt with. 
um, events that they had transpired. And then they just followed procedures and forced those procedures on us to mind wipe us in a cattle barn office of all places and chairs. And we thought we'd get in trouble by telling them anything more about us. So they actually succeeded in the wipe and then kind of tricked us with the wipe and how they did it and the chemical concoctions. And then it got harder from that point on to retain memory for some reason, but I know it would be a snapback point and then a rubber band effect because it wasn't our first rodeo and evidence was buried in the Selmar cemetery, like so many other closed loop places like the power and lights district of Kansas city and uh, the flying saucer bar that just got closed. Um, the FBI did service to kids at times like the Montauk rescuers. Um, but this event was a great disservice to us and it was poorly handled and done sloppily without concern for our future well-being. And on the other hand, though, I'd also like to thank the well-intended people who had a part in raising me and watched out for me and uh, teams and any trainers who I learned a great deal from, especially the ones who taught me to honor, respect, and serve this nation without mental reservation and be a true oath keeper until the end and live up to my word because respect is gained by actions, your virtue, your integrity, not just by thinking something or saying something. It has to be demonstrated and shown like Christ demonstrated his sacrifice and love for us. That sets his seal upon us. So I hope that, uh, that many more people can take this oath in the face of domestic enemies who are let loose on the streets right now and just know that they hate it when you pray publicly with a flag because it's a threat to them since they know that it's God Almighty when proclaimed over this nation that has the, the power to deliver, rescue, and redeem an entire nation to cover us um, when you plead the blood. So just keep doing that and let it spread like wildfire until this nation can be cleansed and purified of the enemy's camps that hate you and what you stand for. Um, the wicked are already doomed. I mean, they have no freedom in Christ who gives liberally of his spirit because they're not of his spirit. They're cut off. And where his spirit is, is where liberty and freedom is. And that hedge of protection in his universal law. Because you have an unending freedom in your soul in him. And it's ongoing. And then you bear his image of eternity. And that's what they despise. It's something that they can't have. So they want to take it from you and snuff out your light. And um, their covetousness is what is um, the sin that keeps transpiring from them wanting to go and take everything from everybody. And... The word of God says that the city of chaos is shattered. That's what he thinks about chaos. And every house is closed to entry. So he'll shut it all down. He doesn't want any part of it. It doesn't come or originate from him. And Isaiah 24 says what the Lord thinks of chaos and lawlessness too, as, long as, as well as Isaiah 40. He brings dignitaries to nothing, makes the judges and rulers of earth as chaos. Now, the definition of that is emptiness, falsity, and futility. That's what they're reaping more of. Thinking delusionally that they're gaining anything. Because he didn't create creation for chaos. And he didn't design us for that to be filled with that void and empty space. Um, that's reserved, that outer darkness, just for the fallen. He designed us to be filled with his spirit and worship and praise him to have that relationship and uh, joy and abundance life abundantly. So then he says, all who make idols are of confusion, chaos and worthlessness says Yahweh. For in the confusion, the Lord declares what is right and what is law and order. So that's what you need to tune into. Proverbs 12, 22 talks about the spirit of lying in America that's being stripped of its power right now. And all masks coming off and all layers and blankets of secrecy and mind control. And all its friends that are spirits in that legion. To persuade the minds of men, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord who is listening to the federal court proceedings, by the way. And those who act faithfully 
on the other end of the spectrum, those people who act out of faith and stand on faith and have a foundation, they're his delight because he loves justice and he's going to show us that. Hosea 12, 6 says, when we return to him, we maintain his love and faithfulness. He will show us his love for true justice. And we're supposed to wait for our God always in all things and to submit to him in all things. Because he's our judge, our heavenly jury, and executioner in the throne room. The Elohim, they're mighty counselors with divine mandates. And his word says, not all things you want are to do are beneficial or constructive. But if you follow God's law, he will set us high above all nations under the blessings of Deuteronomy 28. Corinthians also talks about orders and factions and those among us showing themselves approved and then becoming evident among us. So we're going to see that who's evidently on the dark side, who's evidently on the light side and more and more of God's truth will be revealed and poured out in revelations and become evident in our lives when we walk with him and see things as he sees them, because then his light will fill us and our eye will be single to his glory. So the government, Isaiah 9 talks about this. It says, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will establish and uphold justice and righteousness when we are zealous for him as he is zealous for us. So that's relationship, working. Do everything in love is working for the kingdom and commit to him so he can establish our plans that won't fall, like the plans of Chop or Chaz hypocrisy. Um, so seek the welfare of the city and in its welfare, you'll have welfare. So we can't take out of a, a pool of something that we don't have to give. And you can only give of what you're composed of, what you already have grown within yourself or what the Lord gives you, the fruits of the spirit. So it's when he sees that and searches a city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God, as Hebrew 11 says, then he'll commit to us the word of reconciliation because his word never returns to him void and his word is already settled in heaven. And it's him who will judge, Yah will judge between the nations. So we don't need the corrupt Luciferian United Nations to throw a wrench in our works and try to dismantle this country and other countries of this nation. And the U.S. needs to pull out of that trap because Yahweh will render decisions for many people, as Isaiah 2 states. In judgment, the Lord weighs the heart. Proverbs 21 says, um, the heart is where it is, and that's our stargate to Zion, the Messianic door, depending on our heart's purity. That's how you get through. And our clean hands and spotless garments so that we're blameless standing before him. And if we crucify our flesh every day and die to ourselves, that's how we become blameless. Because when he sees us, he sees Christ. And he doesn't see the sin nature and the sin man, but the transformed spirit man that's already with him. Psalms 110 says he sends forth from Zion a mighty scepter to rule in the midst of our enemies. For those who choose to be in a dry place and in defiance and rebellion and spiritual drought and think that their, their own way is the only way above God and they have their own truth, um, he'll cast down those vain imaginations that rose up against the Most High, every single one of them, under Deuteronomy 28 as well. He will smite them with the curses, with consumption, with fiery heat, and then make the rain of their land powder to become dust, and heaven will come down on them until they're destroyed. So that's a crushing. And the Holy Spirit is like a cleansing broom that sweeps out our impurities, just blows them away, and um, is wonderful. And it cellularly rearranges us and sustains us. But the broom of destruction is for those who are fit for death, since all they do is hang the wages of sin around themselves as a yoke that they put on themselves. The wages of sin are death. And no trace of them re will remain. Nothing will remain. Even the knowledge that they think they have will be taken from them. So they'll be mindless. Um, after God's done with them, they're all done. They're dead. There's no coming back. For those who can receive Psalm 72, he says he'll come down like rain upon the mown grass as showers that water the earth. And Hosea 10, 12 says uh, that he's pointing us to the dew of resurrection. 
in these words. Sow righteousness for yourselves. Reap the fruit of unfailing love. Break up unplowed ground. It's time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness upon you and lavishes you with his love because he's the living water and the living bread. Deuteronomy 32 says, my doctrine. Yahweh is talking about his doctrine, not the doctrines of man and the indoctrinations and the churches. His doctrine, which is pure religion, shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb and showers on the grass. Now man's souls and lives are likened to blades of grass that rise up and die in his harvest field because we're not in the Garden of Eden, even. Adam and Eve wandered into the land of Nod. And this is the field. It's his field and he's in the harvest. So when we are washed in the blood, we have his blood covering. It's like cleansing rain. It's like the dew of resurrection. We have a blood covering blood barrier that acts as a veil. A second skin. We become citizens of a kingdom that's not of this world, and it's a filter to stand in heaven's armies. And it's a privilege to stand in heaven's armies and be considered a citizen of a kingdom that's not of this world. And then at that point, we know all things work together for our good to those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And our business and our busynessness in life should be for him so he can fill us with life abundantly. And things that aren't influenced by the Holy Spirit will become non-essential eventually until his people are sorted out and his bride refined and his warrior bride, his golden eagles are in unity and rely solely on him completely as in the days of old so that we look like ancient Israel to him when he sees us. So he wants to come and be with us like he did in days of old and it'll be more profound the things that we see that ancient Israel saw and dealt with more profound and all the old gods that ancient Israel battled with and dealt with are the same ones that modern and current future body of Israel, spirit Israel all together battles as the body of Christ. So we need to rely on his coming together in his body and not the beast system for our sustenance, our well-being, our abundance, our hope, our prosperity, all He's sufficient. The second exodus will be his people crossing over to his sanctuary cities, his portal cities of light. And then many enemies also leaving the land too and being purged into other areas of the world. And the seventh seal is what opens the deed to the earth. And that's uh, his timeless love and all the things and the work that he did on the cross that opens that the earth's deed scroll to terraform it into a new heaven and a new earth and melt all of the elements and mountains because he is a consuming fire so everything will be baptized with fire and melted with fire to be born again and recreated so i pray blessings over the dia and the dod the pentagon and space force especially right now and the nro to get right in their departments, get right with God. Those who still have a chance, still have time to do the right things, to make a change, to make a difference, to become a majority, to make a shift and make a change of the guard. And that's all geared and aimed at making America great again if their actions are just and if they're acting justly. So they need to submit to all things in their own lives and then submit all their works that they think are so great to the most high who is great so that he can come in and do a great work with them and all that they've done. And the most highly intelligent people have done that think of themselves so highly, let him come in and do the great work and show you what greatness is. And then all aspects of country, our country's security will be in his hands. All our financial problems, everything laid down at the foot of the cross. That's how we get delivered. And it won't just, and I'm hoping it's not just going to be two or three people who would be gathered in his name and know that he's there, but that it'd be two or three whole agencies that would be gathered in his name to bear his arms and to be in his arms. 
and to make those good choices from free will and to desire goodness and exemplify goodness. Just as Christ came down and was the expiation of the Father and the express image of him and his goodness. Because he can turn any bad situation, any hopeless situation, any chaotic situation into good and turn your ashes into beauty, make new beginnings, make a way where there is no way, a road where there is no road. And there's nothing that he can't do. And he has that resurrection power to do that and transform us inside out when we exalt him. Because then he turns around and exalts himself in us and places his authority and power in us to live in us because he does love us. And that's what is going to bring heaven down to earth. So if we let his seven lamps of fire, those seven spirits, because he has eyes of fire, be that guiding light for the five and seven eyes intelligence programs for the mind. If we let that mind of Christ enlighten these areas and these secret locks places and things that we think we have so cipher coded and locked that nobody could ever break or see or uncover or unbury. So he can just it. turn one stone over and cover it all with one move of his breath. So let Christ come in and enlighten those darkened areas and quicken and straighten all of it out and let everything be steered so that balance can come through that. And as me and Sean learned in the time continuum, qua QUA reality streams, these things acted between us um, like we needed to be standing on water on opposite ends of a balancing board is how we perceived it as. We had to intricately and intimately work with one another to make that balancing board happen. And we learned hard lessons and all the quantum fluxes and fluctuations and errors and mistakes, but one truth still remains above all quantum domains. And that's the spirit of the living God, the creator, Yahushua HaMashiach of Nazareth. That's the only place you'll find the answers to peace and truth everlasting. And really that's the only thing. It's the only thing also that's going to, uh, pull you through the storm 